This week, we meet the biohackers, the super agers, and the brain trackers to find out if tech really can stop us from getting old. Welcome to Click. We're outside again. Great to see you in the flesh again. And you. I can't believe it. No matter how long it is since I've seen people, as soon as I see friends and family again, it's like we've never been apart. Yep, too right. Although this time round, I think everybody's really gone for it with their hair since the hairdressers reopened. What are you talking about? I tell you what, though, it is true that we've spent so much time apart in the last year that when we do see people in the reels, you really notice the difference. My parents can't believe how much my kids have grown since they last saw them. And that's kind of what we're talking about today. The fact that even though we're all getting older on the outside, there are ways to stay younger on the inside by hacking our health. Now, if you're anything like me, you may be using an activity tracker to log your exercise. But at the moment, we're just scratching the surface of the data that's hidden inside our bodies. Aside from exercise, there's genetics, sleep, diet, so many other lifestyle factors that can really make a difference. And there are some people who believe that if we can unlock this complete picture of our health, then we might be able to stop or even reverse the ageing process. Instead of talking about lifespan, we're now talking about health span. The desire to stay as fit and healthy as possible for as long as possible, even though the years are ticking on by. Now, the years have been clocking up on this fine frame. My chronological age, therefore, is 47, but there is something else called a biological age, which is the age that you are inside. Now, I've had that checked. Have a guess at the results. Um, 21. And now she has just taken the mickey. Let's find out. King's Genomics Centre, part of a world-leading research university in London, and where I'm discovering the secrets in my DNA. So James, a few weeks ago I spat into a tube and posted it to you. You're welcome. <laughs> my epigenetic age is 44.1. Not too bad. Yeah, so your, your biological age, we just it's basically seeing how your cells are aging, various things such as your diet, how much stress you're under, how much sleep you're getting. It's a nice barometer to pre predict your future health. My genes didn't just deliver one age though. Moodoo uses artificial intelligence to trawl through 850,000 different biological markers to deliver different ages for different body parts. For example, my eye age is 53, but my hearing age is 43.7. And the key thing that scientists now know is that although your genes do set you on your life's course, they are not set in stone. Your genetics will underpin most of your predispositions, so they'll give you a positive or a negative. Whether that actually comes into fruition is up to you, really, because you, you flick on these genes with your lifestyle and environment. The company has run tests with some two and a half thousand people, but more research will be needed to take some of its advice from anecdotal evidence to scientific fact. If you want to reduce your memory age, then dancing is quite good apparently. I've got old eyes. Carrots. We've always been told that carrots are quite good for us, and they're actually true. Have you ever seen a rabbit wearing glasses? Now, whether you go the full Bugs Bunny or whether you samba your way to better brain health, this is about building a personalised picture of health. What works for me will, will not work for you and vice versa, but we'll be able to actually pinpoint what your diet needs to look like, how much stress you can be exposed to, what, what pharmaceuticals you can and cannot take. We can pinpoint them exactly, specifically to you. Saying, OK, I'm going to try and go to bed maybe an hour earlier. I'm going to go for a walk in the morning. What's that going to do to my biological age? Because it, it gamifies genetics. Moodoo has partnered with King's College London, where experts say that our biological age isn't fixed. And in fact, doesn't have to progress in just one direction. The ageing or biological score is malleable. The risk of getting uh, an age-related disease such as diabetes can be increased or decreased based on your lifestyle. 
And that's led some people who I've met in the past to suggest that we might be able to stop the ageing process altogether. Most notably, Aubrey de Grey, who famously suggested that within the next century, we might be able to extend our lifespan by hundreds of years. We develop ways at the molecular and cellular level to repair the damage that the body does to itself throughout life. There's a lot of talk about stopping the ageing process sure. or even reversing the ageing process. Towards the end of my lifetime, probably, I, I think we can have immortality if, you, if you're willing to pay for it. Now, genetic trackers are not the only testing tool to help counter ageing. Another company has analysed things called glycans in my blood. These have given me an idea of the age of my immune system. In this case, we're looking at sugars on immunoglobulin, which is the most abundant antibody. So it's a key weapon in our arsenal, in our immune system. Now you've measured my biological age at 20. I was flattered for a few seconds and I thought, no, that can't be right. A 40, 50 year old can have a much younger glycan age and that's really good for you. If you're talking about gray hairs or skin, then I would use a different clock for that. Okay. Now, all of these different numbers attached to different bits of my body are leading me to think that we are using the wrong word here. Do you think it's helpful to actually use the word age? The word age in its own right uh, must be taken in context of how you're using it. A biological score would be more sensible way of uh, thinking about your age. And the fact that you can change your biological score is very positive. It's not all doom and gloom, I'm set to be uh, old and decrepit at a certain time in my life. This can be slowed down or even reversed. Whatever your personal measurement is, scores like this could flag impending ill health, with studies spotting that a change in your glycans could signal oncoming arthritis, cardiovascular disease or diabetes up to a decade before onset. Our data set is really good, so it's 150,000 people, that's some which will follow for 20, 30 years. It's a warning where you can still do something about it and prevent it. And just a small warning, a good score now doesn't give you a free pass to a healthy future. So it changes, it's not something that's going to stay the same throughout, and this is a way for you to know if something particularly works for you. Now, I think I'm going to take some of my results with a pinch of salt. Just a pinch though, because that's not good for you either. But there are those who've been tracking their data for more than a decade in an attempt to delay the inevitable. Hi, I'm Tim. I'm 42 chronologically and 25 to 32 biologically. I run one of the largest biohacking communities in the world from London. That's the form there. Most things I track every day where possible, but some things I track on a monthly basis, such as certain blood tests. Actually, can we use the right one? I started doing this because I got chronically sick, so I took it upon myself to start researching ways to optimise my health. I've had epigenetics tests, immune tests, hormone tests. You can see how you compare to the general population, and you can have professionals look at your data and not just rely on your own subjective experience. I start my day with natural light, blue light, when there's not natural sunrise. I currently track around 50 points of data a day, a health ring, which tracks my deep sleep, REM sleep, light sleep, heart rate variability, resting heart rate, respiratory rate, and body temperature. I also have one of these. If my heart has been stressed through the night, I know to have a recovery day and take it easy. Whereas if my vitals are strong, then obviously I will push on and work out harder. I would track it. I track my blood glucose using a constant glucose monitor and what that does is it tells me my response to certain foods so I can actually personalise my nutrition. Some people think it might be extreme having something in my arm all the time but for me living a happy healthy life is more important than people judging me for having a few bits of tech. Here's my daily supplements here, my digestive supplements but this is my backup drawer and my dishwasher. It is really about being the CEO of your own health. There may not be double blind studies behind some of these things, but remember all science is evolving. Some things do work long term, some things don't. 
hyperbaric oxygen therapy really does help the body heal and repair properly. And so there's much more pressure in here, which means we dissolve more oxygen in the blood. It gives me extra mental clarity and I feel very zen in it. And you wouldn't even know that anything was happening. Occasionally your ears pop a little bit. If I've got stuff going on and I need to chill out, then I do meditate. Sensory feedback helps me relax. And it's like the perfect balance between nature and technology. Some may say it's a contradiction of terms needing to use technology to unwind, but the point is most people use technology to unwind already. Think about Netflix. A typical evening for me consists of blue blocking glasses, red light when you don't get to see sunset, going digital free and really having some time to myself. There is such a thing as too much data. You can drive yourself mad tracking too many points. Stress is bad for health, obviously, so letting go a bit is also important. If you're not sleeping well, track that. If you're bloating, track your gut bacteria. It can become a hobby, admittedly, but it's really important that you do the things that you need to do for you. Some of my colleagues would like to live to around 180. No, I want to die as young as possible, as late as possible. That's the goal. Hello and welcome to the week in tech. It was the week Royal Mail announced trialling autonomous drones to deliver packages remotely from mainland UK to the Isles of Scilly. Elon Musk tweeted that Tesla will no longer accept Bitcoin as payment for its vehicles due to climate change concerns. And after a year of being iPhone only, audio-based social networking app Clubhouse became available to Android users in the US. Drivers are suffering petrol shortages as a result of a ransomware attack on a major oil pipeline in the United States. A cyber criminal gang called Darkside has forced Colonial Pipeline to shut down the main part of its network, causing the price of petrol to go up to its highest level in nearly seven years. The UK government launched its new online safety bill, which outlines ways of keeping children safe, stopping racial hate and protecting democracy online. It received criticism from campaigners claiming the bill was too vague and fines too low. And finally, if you want to understand cats, yes, you've guessed it, robots. A group of researchers from Osaka University have developed a four-legged robot which reproduces the neuromuscular dynamics of cats so precisely they can now study the locomotion of the robot instead of experimenting on living, moving animals. What a perfect way to protect our feline friends. How to extend your life is a famous obsession here in Silicon Valley, and the answer may be found in so-called super-agers. I'm Beryl Voss, and I'm 88 years old. She is a picture of health. Twice a week, Beryl volunteers here as a food hall for San Francisco's hungry. Hey. I'll be honest, when I first saw how old Beryl was, I was, I was shocked and sort of thought perhaps it was a, a, a typo on our database. This is a joy because it's just 12 blocks down the hill to work. She's a keen hiker and has a boyfriend. He's younger. He's only 77. <laughs> they might call me a cougar, I guess. <laughs> Beryl's part of a study into why people like her have aged so well and what science can learn from her. Joel Kramer is overseeing that research. So we've already seen really significant gains in longevity over the past 20 to 30 years. The increase in Health span, though, hasn't really kept up with the, uh, the, the increase in lifespan. In Silicon Valley, problems always have solutions, and aging is just another problem. The general goal of these companies is pretty simple. Try and work out why we age, and then produce a product that will prevent it, or at least slow it down. Much of the research is focused on identifying the things that are common amongst the very old and very healthy, and then replicating them. So there already are humans who are living in like 100 plus, really good health. Um, and we're trying to figure out what's different about those people at the molecular level uh, to help the rest of us age better where you have these very large data sets, ideally human data sets too, and you're taking this agnostic approach where you're not saying, oh, we, we know for sure it's this one particular biological pathway that's the key pathway. We say, we don't know. We're just gonna let the data tell us. BioAge Labs is still in its research phase. It hasn't released a product yet. 
However, there are companies in the health span field that have products on the market right now. Elysium Health is a company based in New York that makes dietary supplements. Its product, Matter, is aimed at slowing down brain aging. The problem is the brain shrinks after you uh, reach a certain age. Elysium claims their products can prevent the brain from shrinking, and its efficacy is based on a study at the University of Oxford looking into why brains reduce in size as we get older. There's established data that says that uh, matter will uh, really be helpful because there's really nothing else out there that it, uh, people can take that really works. However, the product is a combination of B vitamins and omega-3, which have both been readily available for years. What's new here is the dose is higher and it's the right combination of B vitamins. And as for anyone claiming a health span miracle drug, well, Joel Kramer says he's skeptical. I think I would call it premature science. Uh, we're a long ways away from being able to identify any of those molecules so that any companies that are out there touting the efficacy of some of these compounds are really selling you a bill of goods. It's more snake oil medicine at this point. Now we're working on a trip to New Zealand in February, a three and a half week hiking trip. We do know lots of things about why some people live longer and healthier lives than others, but many of the answers may not surprise you. Probably the, the strongest recommendation is to choose your parents very well. In other words, get lucky and have really good longevity genes. Anything that's good for your heart is going to be good for your brain. So a heart healthy diet, heart healthy lifestyle. Um, physical exercise is really important. Silicon Valley is trying to distill why people like Beryl are so active at nearly 90. But at the moment, her wonder drug is still good genes, exercise, and a positive outlook on life. <laughs> My secret? I don't know. Friends, people, nature, everything that I love. I want to be like that at 88. Forget all of that hacking and implant stuff we saw earlier on the show. I just want to age well. Come on, don't you want to be a cyborg? I'd love to be a cyborg. Oh, I'm not ready for that. Now, tech to stop us aging is all well and good, but today there are 125 million people aged 80 or over, and many of them are already living with age-related illnesses. Get up and um, sometimes have a cup of tea in bed and wash and dress and have breakfast. Probably go out for a walk if this lovely weather continues and just enjoy life. Meet 89-year-old Eileen. She's one of 50 million people around the world living with Alzheimer's or another form of dementia. To aid her independence, Eileen's family, who lives some distance away, have had her flat fitted with sensors. These track her movements and her use of the kettle and fridge. Mum had a good night last night, we can see from the graph. It did, yeah, I can see that. After the last couple of nights, I noticed there was um, uh, more frequent and mm. close together visits to the bathroom. Eileen's family and care team used the data to make positive changes, like moving her clock to prompt her to make cups of tea to stay hydrated. So we were already looking at a bed sensor and potentially um, a special cup that will detect whether um, someone's having enough to drink. It's about providing intelligence, not data. You can get so many different devices that will just stream out lots of data because ultimately what people want to know is, is really just three things. Is mum okay? Has something gone wrong that I need to respond to immediately? Is something changing over time that I could look at and, and create you know, a better care outcome for her? Like this bio-dose pillbox, filled by a robot and then checked by a pharmacist. It tracks the medication being taken out of it, an alarm goes off if a dose has been missed, and if it's still not taken, a loved one can be alerted. But striking the balance between care and privacy can be challenging. The sensors are there, but um, I'm not aware of them all the time. Just the secure feeling that I'm cared for and that there's always somebody there for me. 
It's so great to see technology help patients and their families. And when it comes to those living with dementia, a new brain analysis tool could help provide earlier diagnosis and even potentially assist in creating better drugs to help. Jen Copestake's been finding out more. Using tools to monitor patients remotely has become more pressing since the coronavirus pandemic. A collaborative study called Radar AD aims to see how Alzheimer's patients can be monitored in new and improved ways. One of the assessment tools in the study is an augmented reality app called Altoida, which is showing spatial navigation and memory function. It works by asking the person to choose three virtual objects and place them around a room. They then have to remember where they placed the object, what order it was, and what the actual object was. Go to where you want to place the heart. As well as this memory test, off-the-shelf technology like Fitbits and cameras are being repurposed too. So this is a medallion camera that the participant wears around their neck and it captures um, digital photographs on a cyclic basis, so it doesn't take constant footage, but it does provide valuable contextual information. While Alzheimer's is not a movement disorder, gait analysis trackers can gather useful data points. Two go on the instep of each foot, and then the final one goes on the right hip. We do know that as cognitive decline worsens, it does cause changes in walking patterns, so they might suddenly change direction or stop because they're not sure where they are, they've realised they're going in the wrong direction. In the UK, over 850,000 people are living with dementia. Do you want me to run through the instructions again briefly? Normally, dementia is diagnosed through a series of paper memory tests in person with a doctor. But these tests lack nuance and can be learned by the patient over time. John Hart and his partner Richard Pinder are here in Crowborough Hospital in East Sussex testing a new app called Cognitivity, which aims to prevent this. So if you see an animal, you're clicking on the right side of the screen. John's recently been diagnosed with Alzheimer's disease. There were many ver verbal tests and mm. number tests. Mm. I'm used to people respecting me and not yeah. Um, asking a silly question. To be in that position, I think, was difficult at first, really. Instead of lists of questions, the app flashes rapid images. Each picture is either an image of an animal or not an animal. The user indicates their choice by pressing the left or right side of the iPad screen. As it cannot be learned, the test gives an objective analysis of the patient's neurological state, even when repeated multiple times. What the test does is use uh, what we call rapid visual categorization, and it's really looking to see how quickly the brain can process complicated information. Is it always an animal or a landscape? Uh, so it's always an animal or, or not an animal, right. uh, and that's actually a very important aspect of the test because the human brain is very finely tuned to be able to pick up on animal stimuli. The use of this will make it easier to assess larger number of patients, but more importantly, it speeds the referral process and results with early diagnosis and early treatment for patients, which is exceptionally important. Another possible way to remotely measure cognitive function is through brainwave analysis. Headsets like this one from Belfast Brainwave Bank could be used at home to track changes in brain activity. The EEG scanner connects with a smartphone app to record and analyze data. As subtle changes in brain activity can be observed up to 10 years before symptoms of dementia present, these technologies could all be vital in early diagnosis. And the more individual data that's collected can also feed into bespoke treatment plans and drug development. Wow, what a show! I feel a bit younger just from watching it, you know. Do you? I'm actually feeling a bit concerned that I haven't been doing the things I should have been doing for anti-aging. Come on, if you haven't been doing them, no one has. Listen, go and do them this week. I'll see you back in your box next week. That's all we've got time for this week, though. As ever, you can keep up with the team on social media. Find us on YouTube, Instagram, Facebook and Twitter at BBC Click. Thanks for watching and we'll see you soon. Bye-bye.